All right. Um, the next uh, session is documenting uh, the suspension and debarment uh, decision and building the administrative record. This is sort of the guts of the process. So far, we've talked about the basic building blocks in terms of, of what the legal authorities are and some of the standards for assessing evidence and so forth. We've looked at how you put your office together. How do you staff it? What are some of the considerations for processing your actions? Now we're going to slip into actually processing your actions. Uh, what I intend to touch on are, are captured in this slide. Um, basically, a heavy deep dive into some of the legal pinnings under, uh, that, that, that are, must be met in terms of the administrative record, and then considerations for, for documenting your decision. OK, applicable legal authority. The, the, the critical piece, and, and I apologize up front, we, in the entire history of the Air Force, I think we did one non-procurement action, and we did that for another agency. I'm not comfortable with it, and I don't know the process, so this is all heavily far-focused. My guess is if you reach out to one of your colleagues in a civilian agency, they can probably align you with the, uh, uh, the related non-procurement rules. But, um, so I apologize in advance for that. But it is my understanding that both under the non-procurement rule and under the procurement rule, what we're really focusing on is to make our processes as informal as, as, as we possibly can while still providing for fundamental fairness. The words are so simple, and the challenge, though, is seemingly so great. What is the scope of review? This is the ultimate end review. If your decision is challenged, an SDO's decision is challenged, it is not within the agency. SDO decisions are final agency decisions. They're subject to review in federal district court under the Administrative Procedures Act type of standard. And that is, is an arbitrary, capricious, a violation of law, or have we otherwise uh, abused the discretion given to us? It is a very deferential standard. Nonetheless, it's one that uh, from time to time uh, is satisfied by, by uh, the plaintiffs. <laughs> Applicable legal authority. The court reviews the entire administrative record to determine whether or not a decision is, is, is based on appropriate factors. The entire administrative record. Right, nothing, nothing particularly noteworthy there. Frequency electronics. Again, court may not substitute its decision for that of the agency uh, decision maker provided it is not arbitrary, capricious, an abuse of discretion, or a violation of law. Then we come to a more recent decision, Inchscape. Inchscape was a decision involving a Navy action. The private bar sees this as a sea change in how suspension and debarment activities are conducted. Uh, in a recent ADA decision, we on the government side, of course, all denied that. But the reality is, this decision, decided by a court that arguably did not have jurisdiction over the matter, is now out there, and it's something that we're going to have to contend with. And it creates some standards that, frankly, I don't know if we can ever satisfy. The court the court's stated, the judge stated in that decision, the existence of documents outside the record. I, most of our, our decisions, we focus on administrative records. What is in that administrative record? We don't often think about what is not in that administrative record. And that's where this challenge went. The, the plaintiff alleged, look, there's all this positive information. The, the misconduct occurred back in the 2008 time frame. And since then, I've been awarded, my company has been awarded a number of contracts. And each time that award occurred, what happened? The contracting officer made an affirmative responsibility determination concluding that I had the capability and the ability to perform, including the appropriate integrity and so forth. And the court, uh, the plaintiff said, hey, that should have been considered as part of this. And there were other documents outside the record the plaintiff pointed to. In this case, the judge concluded that the FAR specifically states that the SDO should consider the body of available information, weigh its credibility, look for corroboration, he's quoting from the FAR, but then he concludes, it does not appear that the SDO conducted any meaningful investigation. How many of you in here think that it is the SDO's role to conduct any type of investigation? 
That is the right answer. We are in an adjudicatory capacity. We make decisions. We exercise discretion. We are not investigators. Most of our offices are not staffed to conduct investigations, and we wouldn't know how to do it even if they were probably, uh, properly structured. This is a very difficult standard. Uh, I'm hoping that this will get lost by more competent courts of jurisdiction putting the standard back into a more discretionary uh, sort of footing. But for right now, we are stuck with this decision that suggests that we, in the suspending and debarring offices, have a burden to look beyond that record that comes to us from the investigator, from the acquisition community, from whatever source is, is recommending that you take action to see what else might be out there. Yeah, Norm. Could you point out that this was a, a bit protest? Yes. Case? Yeah, okay, I'll go back. I said a court of questionable competent jurisdiction. This is a court of federal claims decision. It was presented in the context of a bid protest. Now, how a court, a judge in the court of federal claims concluded that he had the ability to render such a decision is frankly beyond me, but I think some of the fault is on, on the government side, and that is not contesting jurisdiction on this particular question. The hope is that this will be very, very limited in its application and perhaps corrected as we go down the road. But right now, it creates a bit of a daunting standard that should we be afraid of it? No. But should we be aware of it? Yes. And we've got to make sure that when we're, the records come to us, that we ask appropriate decisions. What other documents are out there? I can't tell you how many times when we're putting something together and we go, well, this doesn't quite clear the hurdle, we say to the investigating agency, and the investigating agency comes back and goes, oh, well, we have these too. That's not the way this game is played, all right? Not the way the game's played. The investigating agency should be providing you with sufficient information uh, upon which to base the decision. Um, your office should be in the position of deciding what should or should not be in that administrative record. My concern, and based on my history in this process, is that the investigators frequently are looking for a kill. They want something to happen to the party being investigated, whether it's civil, criminal, contractual, or suspension and debarment. They want something bad to happen. And because they want something bad to happen, they're frequently not paying attention to other information that might be favorable to the contractor or to the individual. That's a problem. That's a problem, and, and, and our challenge, again, is not to run from this or be afraid of it, but to recognize it and to make sure that we're reaching out and training the investigators, the acquisition community, the grants uh, community, whatever organization is providing recommendations to your offices, they need to be trained on being more holistic in their approach to assembling these records and getting information to you, whether it's good, bad, or otherwise. Um, the notice, we're basically uh, sort of the same process in, in both rules, as I understand it, and that is we have to be fair in our notice. Not a lot of information, and it's all listed. Um, you'll see in the materials that were provided uh, templates, particularly uh, Air Force templates, that identified language that we think is useful in a notice letter. Um, we do things a little differently. We have a notice when we initiate actions. We have a notice letter as well as a memorandum that supports the action. That is, it lays out the specific facts and circumstances and legal authority for taking the action. So it's a, it's a, it's a, these things go out in tandem. But this is what is supposed to be uh, included in the notice as a minimum. Now, I would note, uh, note here in the area of practices, the FAR, and I believe the non rule, refers to certified mail return receipt requested. We in the uh, Air Force have found that to be a very, very difficult uh, process to satisfy. Our office is located outside the Pentagon. Whenever we do this kind of thing, we have to package these things up. I, like most other folks, don't know how to put the green cards together. There's a lot of work that goes with these things. And then we have to take them to the Pentagon and make sure that the people in the Pentagon properly account for them, rip the green pages off and do whatever they do, and then actually send them out. And then, oh, by the way, on the return receipt, it doesn't come back directly to us, it goes to the Pentagon. 
stuff in there gets laced and daced and diced and radiated, and then it comes in all crispy and messed up, and it's <laughs> six months later. We can't use this process. We use Federal Express. My thought process is that as long as the Air Force doesn't take away my ability to use this, Federal Express provides a, a process for providing notice that is as good as, if not better than, return receipt requested. So just throwing that out for a, a little bit of, you know, there is some, some room, I believe, for, for practices that are a little easier sometimes. OK, suspension notice. A lot of the same things go in the suspension notice. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. Debarment decisions. Again, this is what uh, was, was being harped on in, in, in the uh, Inchscape decision. Uh, there's the standard for debarment. Again, where there's no genuine dispute of material facts, you can rely on a conviction or civil judgment. But it has to be a decision based on all the information in the administrative record. It is absolutely critical that you not ignore chunks or pieces of that record, whether it's from the government or whether it's from the respondent, or whether it's from a related party. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit further. In actions involving disputed material facts, the record must also include written findings of fact. We've done this poll before. I think in the history of the federal government, there are probably fewer than 10, and that, that's probably a really high number, hearings that have been held to resolve disputed material facts. It doesn't happen that often. Um, just a little uh, tip here is when you put your actions together, you generally have more than a single cause to support your action. When respondents come in and they're able to provide facts that don't appear to be controverted, I recommend that you accept those facts uh, as, as, being, as being reliable and use them and recognize that in most cases you still have a lot of other information independent of those things that support the decision that you, you feel is appropriate in the situation. Um, you, there's just no reason to get bogged down in most cases with disputed material fact. But when that occurs, recognize that this requires a fact-finding hearing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it simply because we don't do many of them. But a fact-finding hearing, it has to be transcribed. There's an opportunity to call witnesses. It has to be records created. It really is a very expensive burden. Um, we've done one of them, and uh, we, we just try to avoid fact-finding hearings. Same thing with suspensions. Um, if you've got an indictment, you need to go no further in your record. Uh, I can't tell you how many times respondents get just completely uh, flipped out when you have a record consisting of about six pages, which is the indictment. But when you have an, and, and, and the paragraph, the language supporting it in the memorandum is about three paragraphs long. You don't need anything more than that. You've cleared the legal hurdle in those actions. OK, the administrative record, this is the guts of what we do. It can be very complicated, particularly if you end up in an action with thousands or tens of thousands of pages. The question you have to ask yourself is, is your office set up to handle that kind of a matter? And if it's not, before you kick off, you should really think about what you need to bring to support your effort, uh, whether it's within your agency or whether you reach outside your agency for additional support. The administrative record, how much is enough? All right, we know we have to consider the body of available information. This is really going to, in most cases, come down to what have the folks put together in their recommendation, whether it's the investigators or the acquisition community or otherwise. You need to ask them, well, have you interviewed the respondent? Is that in the record? What else do you have? Um, to simply accept a record and not ask questions about what else is out there I think that starts to get you into some problems. So in your intake process, one of the first questions should be, is there anything else out there that you have collected as part of your investigation? If so, what is it? Can I look at it? Is there some reason why I shouldn't be able to look at it? 
your staff should understand and appreciate what that universe of documents is. All right? Um, when we make decisions in a suspension, we, it, we, we get a nice little summary of, of what the decision-making process should involve. Agencies should consider how much information is available, how credible the information is, whether the allegations, the important allegations are supported, and what inferences can reasonably be made. Part of that discretionary process allows you to take your record and draw inferences. Right? We're not limited simply by the black and the white. We don't have to put our logic to rest when we're looking at an administrative record. We have to include evidence relating to mitigating factors. If you know of information that is favorable to the respondent, you have an obligation to make sure that that information gets included in your records. And you should include any other exculpatory information. And as you go forward, uh, be sensitive to what is out there, what may be out there that supports the arguments or the facts that the respondent is presenting for your consideration. Department of Defense guidelines. We have some practice tips that come out of this thing. Um, to the extent possible, and this is where it gets difficult. You know, we, at the very beginning, we talked about how's your office structure? Is it in the acquisition side or is it in the general counsel side? Um, and if you're in the process of standing up a suspension and debarment activity, you should keep in mind that. One of the bigger challenges we have, especially in a, I think I heard the term siloed office, such as mine, is that my office has access to information that will be included in that administrative record and information that will not be included in that administrative record that is still relevant to the underlying matter. In my office, and, and I know this is the same with several other agencies, particularly the DOD agencies, Information comes in, the staff looks at it and determines this should be in there. But that legal memorandum received from the field, that doesn't add anything of evidentiary value. That's just basically a presentation of law and argument. That should not be in there. And you have to make some decisions. The staff has to make some smart decisions on what goes in the record, as a matter of fact, and what stays out of that record. The bigger challenge is to, within the office, if you are a siloed office, to establish a process or procedure or controls that prevents that information from going over to the suspending and debarring official. What you do not want, at the end of the day, is the respondent to be able to argue that the suspending and debarring official made his or her decision based on information not in the record. And the temptation will be there if you've been out there playing in a legal memorandum, if you're the SDO, and you've had access to a legal memorandum, or you've had access to other perhaps highly speculative, not entirely reliable information, and now you're writing a decision that does not include that material as part of the record. Challenge is, how do you, within that office, keep that information segregated? It's still going to come down to a matter of trust, particularly, again, in an office like mine. I, I, I run the office. Um, I have access to all information in there. We are very electronic focused. So within a given folder, what we will have is the case name. You open that folder, and one of the first things that you get is AR or non-AR, administrative record or non-administrative record. I do not look into the non-administrative folder, except for drafts. You know, so there's another subfolder that's drafts. Otherwise, I, I make it a point, never to look at that non-administrative record information. And I think it works well. Now, there's a lot of grumbling by industry and the private bar going, well, really, how do you, how do you, how do you keep this information from flowing? To 100% absolute certainty, you can't. But you owe it to have a practice in place that is easily explained should the question arise as to what did the SDO consider. Got to think about ways to keep this information segregated in a way that you can explain it to the respondent and, if necessary, explain it to a court. And if you gain access to information that is not in the record, the challenge on the SDO at that point is to make absolutely certain in rendering a decision that there is no reliance 
on this information that is outside the record. It's not an impossible thing to do. In fact, it's a very typical thing to do. In judge alone trials, judges are constantly receiving information that ultimately is ruled to be non-admissible. The judge's challenge at that point is when he or she gets to their decision that they exclude that information from consideration. It's not an impossible standard. It's exercised all the time. But for us in the suspension and debarment world, it does create the opportunity for unnecessary argument by the bar if you don't have clean procedures between your administrative record and your non-administrative materials. OK, uh, other practice tips. Withholding information. Um, this becomes a, a huge problem for us when we have multiple parties involved in the same transaction or occurrence. Presently, we have one suspension action that has 63 respondents. Norm, I think you had one with, what, 300? Um, there are frequently going to be situations where you have multiple parties involved in the same transaction or occurrence. These multiple parties, in many cases, are represented by different counsel. They have different interests, different equities, and they're going to come in with their own set of, of information and argument for your consideration. The challenge for the suspending and debarring offices is to determine when is it appropriate to take that information, the factual information provided in these multi-party actions, and share it with the other parties. This can become a real huge problem, particularly where you have an opposing counsel who realizes that he or she does not have any way to win on the merits, and they've made it their objective to put in procedural error, to try to introduce procedural error into the record. All right? This can become very, very difficult, and it requires a great deal of time and attention to keep this information straight. So the first thing to do is to, one, make sure that you've got some authority within your agency that allows you to withhold information. In the Department of Defense, we have Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, Appendix H, which says that if there is a reason to withhold information from the contractor, any portion of the record, I can do it, but I have to inform the contractor of what was withheld and what was my reason for doing so. All right. You need to do this, well, first of all, you need to make sure that your agency has this type of authority. If you don't, it can get real ugly real quick. If you do, then you can go on to this process about, all right, how do we withhold information? In our office, we try not to withhold full documents. We try to be as precise as we can and to redact. It's very useful to have good redaction software for this, this purpose. But the critical piece here is that explanation that is required. You've got to use this as your opportunity to create a contemporaneous record as to why you did not provide all information to that respondent. It's critical that you create that record now as opposed to waiting until you find yourself in litigation and then you've introduced the opportunity for the respondent to argue you were basically doing some sort of a post hoc rationalization as to why you did or did not do something. So make a contemporaneous record explaining, I have withheld this information. I have done so for this reason. And what we try to do is at least provide a general explanation of what was withheld. All right? It was personal identifying information. It was confidential information of a certain, uh, a certain matter. And this is why it may or may not be important to your client. Um, so some of the things to consider, redacting PII, you should always do that. Redact agents' names, we do that as a matter of course if they forget to do so when they give us the records. Confidential source information, usually, again, the agents are pretty good about that, but we'll double check. Classified information goes without saying. And uh, when you have to redact this information, Think about what other options are out there to provide something of equal or near equal value. By way of example, a lot of times agents don't want to give up the affidavits they use to support a search warrant. All right? Or in the IC community, these guys don't want to give up anything. All right? Because it's all classified or whatever. 
you can still work with your agents, you can still work with whatever community is providing your information to get a summary of what is the important information without revealing sources or whatever needs to be protected. Think about getting a declaration from the submitter saying, okay, I can't give you this affidavit, but here's the substance of what we knew at the time we did it. And it probably avoids a lot of the specifics that are causing the need to otherwise withhold that information. Then you can keep out of the record that, that search warrant and you can put in, or excuse me, that affidavit, and you can put in that declaration. You need to be creative when you're preparing your record. But the, 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 the critical point here is do it at the time you're preparing your record. Don't get caught after the fact going, oops, we need to pull this, or oops, we now need to explain this. Make it a contemporaneous, well thought out process. OK, supplementing the record. Uh, again, this, this stuff can get ridiculously tricky when you have 63 or 300 parties to the same transaction or occurrence, all right? But typically what we will do is we will issue our notice, we will issue, issue our legal memoranda, and we will say that the record is available upon request. Uh, in about 50% of the cases, we don't get a response at all, and we save ourselves the need to produce a record. In the other 50% of the cases, we get a request for record. We provide that record electronically very quickly, as I said earlier. And then the respondent at that point has 30 days, or longer if we think it's appropriate, to provide us with a response. So what do you do when you get that response back? All right, first, if you have multiple parties, as I said earlier, you got to think about what portion of the new facts that were presented need to be shared. And you need to think about how you're going to share that information. As a matter of course, we also take any information, factual information that is submitted by respondents, and we kick that information back to the party that was making the recommendation for action in the first place, whether investigators, the acquisition community, or, or whatever the source. And we ask them, we give them usually two weeks or so to verify or dispute whatever that information is. Again, my office, we're not investigators, and we're not gonna play the role of investigator. We expect that we will kick this information back to those that have the responsibility for bringing this information together in the first place to determine whether or not we're being lied to or whether this is, this is useful information. In many cases, we find that in fact, this is probably the information provided by the respondent is not accurate. We won't call it a lie, but we'll say it's not accurate. And then the our side, uh, the, the, the investigators, are given the opportunity to further supplement the record to try to correct the inaccuracies that have been identified in the respondent's submission. What do you do with that? Well, that's not part of your record. You've got to give it to the respondent. All right? This stuff can go on a long damn time occasionally. All right? But you've got, this becomes, in many cases, a highly iterative process. And you continue this process until such time as the suspending and debarring official determines that the record is closed, at which point no further information, factual information, is, is, is submitted. We make it a point in our notice letters, when we have multi-party actions, to let the respondents know that their submissions are likely to be given out to the other respondents. We think that that is, that is a matter of fairness. And you'll see that language later on in the presentation, also in the materials in the little spiral bond. Um, resolve objections early as possible. Again, you want to keep this as contemporaneous as you can. You don't want to be looking at hindsight going, oops, should have done x, y, or z. So handling this record, um, can, using this record, it, it's, it can be a big challenge, particularly as you're getting out of the starting blocks with your program. Closing the record. Um, the decision has to be issued within 30 working days of which the record is closed. As a practice, we try to make it clear to the respondents when the record closes so that that, that, that time starts to, uh, starts to tick off. Again, just a matter of, of, of trying to be as fair as we can with the respondents. 
Occasionally, you're not going to make that 30 working day. And the rules permit you, for good cause, to extend that time for a final decision. Um, in many cases, I believe that allowing the government stakeholders that opportunity to confirm or refute information provided by the respondent is part of this good cause analysis. That is, if the respondent submits information, factual information, and we have to kick it back to the investigators, and the investigators can't turn it in two weeks, it's going to take them six weeks, I'm going to give them the six weeks if it's reasonable. All right? Even though that's going to extend this process. Um, advise the respondent, as I said, advise the respondent when the record closes. It's just, it's just a, it's just a nice courtesy. Okay. More practice tips. Um, have the record prepared. I, I said this earlier. I have heard from private bar time and time again about various agencies that it takes weeks to get their records. All right. That is unsatisfactory. And if we as a suspension and debarment community don't deal with that, our friends on the Hill are going to deal with it. All right? We have got to turn this stuff as quickly as possible. When we kick off our actions, under either rule, even though under the non-procurement rule, if it's a proposed debarment, they're not listed, the point remains there is reputational damage that is occurring. All right? There is a loss of revenue in most cases that is occurring under the procurement rule. Before you initiate your notice and put any party on the list, your record should be ready to go so that the day the request is received, you can turn. If it is more than a one-day turn, I submit that you are doing a disservice to the federal government and to the public and to the respondents. All right. I think it's entirely appropriate for us as a federal, uh, federal susp suspension and debarment community to have a one day or no more than three days because occasionally you're going to have a one working day sort of a standard. The point is you've got to turn these things. It's a matter of fairness. We number our records sequentially, just a, a, a simple uh, numbering software. It's very useful when you're preparing your final decisions to be able to cite and quote to uh, all, the, all the, the record that you need to support your, your, uh, your final decisions. Which, when we issue our notices and the proposed memorandum in our notices, we use very notice-like pleading. We don't dig into a lot of detail. In our final decisions, we are very detailed. As a revised practice as of about a half year ago, in all of our decisions now, each and every factual proposition must have and will have a factual site to the record. All right? It's helpful if you Bates number your pages to do that. And the reason we, we do this very detailed exercise of making sure that all of our factual allegations are identified in our memos is to ensure the accuracy on our part and to build a very contemporaneous record should there ultimately be judicial review. So the court, likewise, can easily go to the record and figure out what's going on. So consider numbering your pages so you don't have to say, you know, tab six, page four. You can just go AR blanky blank 61, or whatever the case may be. We direct respondents, likewise, to number their pages sequentially. And frankly, most of them do. Most of them do it, and, and when it doesn't happen, it's usually on smaller matters where the record is not all that difficult or complicated to work with. We also direct the respondents, we issue our records electronically. We put them on a, if we can email them, we'll email them. Otherwise, we put them on a disk, we send the disks out. We ask that when the respondents make their submissions that they provide us three copies, written copies, and that they also provide us an electronic copy. Um, as of about two years ago, our office now keeps almost exclusively electronic records. The only time that we'll have any papers uh, is when an action is alive and well. And, and generally speaking, the only thing that we'll have in there are uh, the submissions, the written submissions made by the respondent. But it's very helpful if you put that copying burden uh, on the respondents and you have them do it electronically. And again, supplement in a timely manner. Uh, it's not just up front, it's throughout the process. Initiating the action, um, 
I'm not going to dig into this all that deeply. You've got a lot of uh, templates in, our, in the, uh, the spiral bound. Now, one of the things you'll see in there is that there's text, and then there is the highlighted yellow information. What we have tried to do with our, with our notice letters, and let's start with just the notice letters first, is to make them standard as they possibly can get. So we have essentially one letter that we use for companies and one letter that we use for individuals. And the only things that change on those letters are the addressee and that first line that says, we are proposing you such and such and such and such for whatever the action may be, and then the designation of the action attorney. Everything else in that letter uh, is absolutely uh, the same for every individual or every company. Uh, it took a long time to get to that kind of a standard. Uh, and frankly, the, the fewer changes you have to make in your notice letter, the faster the process goes and the more likely you're going to be accurate with what it is you're doing. Um, so so look, at those, look at those things in there. And uh, if you have questions, uh, I have a lot of staff members. Not a lot. I don't have a lot of staff members. But I have folks here uh, from the Air Force that can help uh, answer your questions. But you'll see that templates can really, really help. Templates are not quite as good when it comes to the uh, memoranda. There, what's useful is to have standard stock language for your causes. There's no reason for screwing up your cause if you can just simply cut and paste uh, a, a, a standard blur. Um, it's, again, that's about the only saving grace for that. OK, back to how much information is enough. Enough information to put the contractor on notice. That's the legal standard. Do you make the administrative record available when you send out your notice letter? Or do you do like we do and say, it's available upon request? All right, the pros and the cons are pretty straightforward. Most respondents, at least in our practice, don't, don't respond. So it makes no sense to be kicking out disks and committing this additional labor. The flip side is we commit ourselves to turning that record within a day. All right? But this is a decision for you to, to work through, whether you want to make your records available when you send out your initial notice or whether you want to make them available upon uh, request. The requirement is to make them available. Protecting the record from third-party requests. We occasionally find, um, primarily for purposes of bid protest actions, that companies, essentially competitors to those companies or those entities that we are considering for suspension or debarment, make requests under the Freedom of Information Act for the record relating to their competitor. Their purpose? does not advance any public purpose whatsoever. Their purpose is purely to try to make some hay and make their, other, their, their competitor look bad. Again, as a matter of fairness, we need to protect the respondents from this kind of, um, this kind of behavior. So you'll see in a bit, we include language in our notice letters that tries to establish that the information provided is voluntarily submitted. And by making it a clear that this is a voluntary process, you lay the foundation for asserting an exemption under the Freedom of Information Act for non-release of the records. Okay? Notice pleading, what, what do you put into your initial documents? I know various agencies do it differently. Some agencies approach it, and in that initial letter, they supposedly have a memorandum, an analysis, that covers the entire gamut. The expectation is that that agency is not, again, going to do any kind of an analysis, that everything's right there, and that if at the end of the day they determine that suspension or debarment is appropriate, they will issue a three or four paragraph notice letter saying, for the reasons we said earlier, you're done, you're out. I don't know how they do that, frankly, because what we've found is, again, about 50% of the time, our actions take on a life of their own. And at the end of the day, when it's time to make the final decision, the record that we're looking at is very different than the record we started with. So I don't know how agencies manage to put their memos, their final memos, in up front. I'd be willing to hear how you do it. Um, 
I frankly don't think that is a particularly good practice unless you know up front that nothing's going to change. Yeah, Norm? When they don't respond. Yeah, when they don't respond, but you don't know that at the time. So, you know, it's a crapshoot, crapshoot for you. Anyway, um, these are things that you have to consider for purposes of your actions. How much information do you put out front? We use a very light notice type of pleading in our memos, our stock notice letter, with the full expectation that they're either not going to respond, at which point we've given them enough information anyway to meet our burden, or if they do respond, that the record that we ultimately make our decision on is going to be fundamentally different, and we're not going to waste a lot of time up front with a detailed analysis. All right. Um, again, here's some excerpts. Uh, it's in your booklet, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this thing. Um, except for some of these funky little proceedings that we have. Uh, this is terrible. I thought this would be kind of cute to use this red stuff, but I've noticed it doesn't show whatsoever in this room. So for those who might be visually impaired like me, this stuff says, to encourage you voluntarily to furnish useful and reliable information and to be candid with our office, you may mark any portion of your submission, including attachments, with an appropriate legend identifying information you customarily withhold from release to the public. In the event our office receives a Freedom of Information Act request concerning your submission, we will afford you an opportunity to opine on the releasability of the marked documents. About a year ago, we had a huge problem involving an action we had taken against Booz Allen Hamilton. We had suspended Booz Allen Hamilton and ultimately entered into an administrative agreement with the company. As a result of the suspension, we got a lot of information from the company. And of course, as in the process of negotiating and then executing the administrative agreement, we got even more information from the company. One of Booz Allen's competitors decided it would be very useful if it could get this information to use for whatever purposes it could to tear down Booz Allen Hamilton. When we received that request, this is one of the first times that we, our office had received a FOIA for basically everything we had touched in the action. Usually we get FOIAs and they ask for the final decisions. No problem. In fact, we publish our final decisions on our website. So it's really easy to say, go to our website. No problem. This is the first time that we had received a full a request for everything that had been introduced to our office. And it was amazing. We fought within the Air Force. You know, most agencies have their little FOIA offices and their FOIA trolls that do all their FOIA stuff. And the FOIA people said, well, no, this, the, you, this stuff is not voluntarily submitted and under the appropriate legal standards. Because they didn't have a choice, this information is now part of a public record. It is releasable. And we spent a great deal of time briefing in writing and, and briefing in person, explaining to the FOIA trolls that they were entirely wrong. Uh, just taking an informal poll, how many of you think that these are, that when a respondent re replies that it is a voluntary submission? How many think it is involuntary, that they're required to do so? Norm, you think they're required to do so? Oh, that sounds discretionary to me, Norm. <laughs> All right, Norm's, Norm's position is if they don't respond, they're going to get debarred or suspended. Yes, but that still is a decision for the company. It is an exercise of their discretion, at least so we argued. It is an exercise of their discretion as to whether or not they want to make a submission. Should they choose to make that submission, they are doing so of their own accord. Accordingly, that is a voluntary submission. And at the end of the day, we finally convinced the Air Force FOIA trolls that indeed was a voluntary submission. And you'll see a little later on, once you clear that test, you can fit nicely into one of the FOIA exemptions that says you don't have to release this information. Right? The other thing that I want to point out here is that when you get these requests for third party releases, you've got to run it by the submitting activity. Really shouldn't be treated any different differently than we do when we get a FOIA request during a source selection. As a matter of course, first step is we go back to the company that was submitted the information and said, we've got this third party request. Can we release? And if not, why not? And identify for, for us what information cannot be released. Same process in our actions. Okay? Okay. 
uh, another cutie out of our notice letters. Um, this takes that any written information submitted by you will be included in the administrative record. This is important because when we have our meetings in opposition, and we, unfortunately, you know, there's only so much time, but we'd love to have been able to have time today to talk about these meetings in opposition because they're, they're, they're fairly important. But from our perspective, those meetings in opposition are of zero evidentiary value. We make our decisions based on what is in the administrative record. That is, it must be a matter of writing. During those presentations of matters in opposition, when they come in with their counsel or solo, and they present information and argument to you, we make it very clear up front, or I make it very clear up front, that the purpose of that gathering is not to take evidence. That, in fact, anything they say or I say during that process will have no evidentiary value. That if information is brought up during that meeting that the respondent believes is important for introducing into the record, or that I believe is important for introducing into the record, that subsequent written submissions will be required. It is an administrative record. They must understand up front that it's only a matter of what is submitted in the written record that will count at the end of the day. Okay. Uh, debarment only, uh, <clears throat> you tell them this, it'll be based on the administrative record, da 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 da. Uh, same thing with uh, the, the, any submission uh, that uh, is, is, is made will be considered. Now here's something that we added about a year and a half ago. We got a little tired of having people lie to us, all right? When they lie to us, when, when, when a company comes in and lies in their submissions, they are making a false statement to an official of the United States government, which is punishable under law. And we finally decided that to try to cut some of this nonsense off, we now put this into our notice letters that's saying, Making any materially false, fictitious, or fraudulent statement or representation to a government official, i.e. me, may subject the maker to prosecution under the US code. It has done a marvelous job of cutting down on a lot of clutter and clatter that we used to receive. I recommend you consider using it. OK, as I told you, there's, this is just sort of the basic structure uh, of, of what should be in the, the, uh, the memorandum. It's going to be dependent on the facts and circumstances of each case. There's very little that can be gathered from this except that the causes, the bases for the proposed debarment, just, just get those cut and paste each time. You don't have to change a single word. And just quote from the FAR or whatever your, your, your guiding regulation is so there's no chance for error to creep in. Um, again, the templates are useful. Just don't guess on your bases. There's no sense introducing that kind of an error, that kind of a, just a clerical type of an error. Um, the memorandums for suspension. We used to say, let's see, let's see, no, sorry. We used to say in the old days that uh, based on the administrative record before me, I find that protection of the government's business interest requires the immediate suspensions of the subjects pending completion of the criminal investigation and suing legal proceedings. Because in most cases, we do have an investigation underway. As a result of InScape, I don't think this is defensible anymore. And we all tend to have like sort of a, kind of like a religion. You know, we all started from the same tree and now we're kind of off here, but at some point we have a lot of commonality into what we put into our notices and memos. If you're still using this as a summary statement, in your suspension notices, I think you're on thin ice. You're going to have to give more analysis in your suspension memos as to why there is immediate need to take action against that respondent. Doesn't require a great deal of effort, but you've got to lay some type of factual foundation and appropriate analysis to support why the exclusion is necessary and what is the immediacy surrounding the need for exclusion. OK, documenting the final department decision. Um, this stuff is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, <clears throat> provide notice 
by certified mail, return receipt requested, unless you use FedEx or some other better than, equal to or better than type of a process. Um, if the bomb is not imposed, notify the respondent. We have a duty to do so. And you know, sometimes I think we don't take that duty as seriously as we take the duty to notify that they're excluded. Right? Just as important to be timely with that, okay? Don't, don't, don't let it just go on the back pile because you know, nothing's gonna happen. Um, while you're letting that thing sit in your back pile, they're excluded, reputational damage continues, so on and so forth. Um, this is again sort of template language, nothing particularly useful there, it's, it's in the spiral bound. Um, spiral bound, but remember, your memorandum, it's like those of you in the acquisition community who do source selections, it's that source selection decision document that will make or break your case. In our actions, it is that legal memorandum, that factual legal memorandum that will make or break your case. You, when you write these things, you've got to make sure that there's enough information in there to clearly support the conclusion that there is a cause for taking action. And again, I think a best practice is to make sure that you're having record references throughout to every factual allegation so you're not missing anything or misstating anything. You have to go through, and so, so the way I work this in my mind is the first step is, is there a cause? If I establish that there is a cause by either adequate evidence for suspension or a preponderance for a for debarment, I usually conclude with that statement, that there is adequate evidence or a preponderance that a cause exists to take this action. That is the end of my burden. That is the end of the government's burden. Now the rest of this memorandum is going to focus on the contractors or the individual's burden to establish present responsibility. So the first thing we're going to do is look at, under a heading of aggravating information, we're going to look at anything aggravating in the record. Did they lie? Did they fail to cooperate? Uh, does their management just not get it? Are the people that committed the misconduct still part of the company? Whatever the aggravating factors are, we're going to identify those in that piece of the analysis. And then we're also going to have the extenuating and mitigating. If you think about this as a three-step process in your analysis, I think it's very helpful. So start with, is the cause established? Once the cause is established by the appropriate evidentiary burden, that burden then shifts to the respondent to establish that they are presently responsible. To assess present responsibility, you need to look at those matters in aggravation and extenuation and mitigation. And if you go through all three of those steps at the end of the day, or at the end of that memorandum, you should have a document that, that, that very clearly shows that how the discretion was exercised and should be able to withstand judicial scrutiny. Okay, releasing documents. I spent, <laughs> spent a bit of time on it. This stuff is on your slides, okay? You, you, we will make the slides available. Again, there were reasons to not do it. We want you to pay attention to us a little bit and not you know, just be playing with your slides and doodling and whatnot. But we also recognize that everything that the agencies do is a little different. And we don't want you to obsess on one way or the other way but to rather pay attention and grasp the general common themes. So this stuff is all in there, but uh, from time to time, you are gonna have to deal with a FOIA challenge. And the critical thing is this notion of you can withhold information, the information is commercial, financial, so on and so forth. It helps a lot, though, when it is um, voluntarily submitted, okay? Exemption 4 protects from disclosure information that was voluntarily submitted to the government if it is of a type that would not customarily be released to the public. Companies do not customarily release information that says, we screwed up. They do not customarily release information saying, we fired X, Y, and Z because of this. They do not generally release to the public all of their drafts and all of their iterations to develop new internal policy, all right? That's where this voluntary piece becomes very important. And if you consider building your record in your notice letter, if and when you get that FOIA request, I think it leads to a much better, fairer result. Okay, AR examples, 
I do not really have time for an AR example, although I do want to walk you through one um, particular mess. And this is this thing with 63 uh, respondents in a suspension. How many of you have dealt with multi-party common transaction or occurrence type uh, actions? Wow, not, not very many of them. That's amazing. All right, I just can't tell you how difficult it is to manage a record when you have 63 independent moving parts. All right, very, very difficult. And what it really takes is for you to have, and Maria talked about it, you have got to have a good record keeping system. You've got to have a good database. You have got to know for each one of those respondents that is, that is playing in your game, that is, that has responded to your action, you've got to know exactly what information you gave them. And you have to be able to assess whether the information provided is appropriate given the larger record. All right, remember, it's not, we, we've got this weird little inch gate thing about this other information outside the record that we've got to be concerned with. Actually, we had that concern before Inchscape, but Inchscape now sort of ratchets up the pressure to get it right. So you've got to be very conscious of what is the universe of the record in this matter. Now, how do you parse that record out for each of the individual respondents that is, that is subject to their own action? You've got to make sure that you have with each of those spikes or spurs a memorandum, a contemporaneous writing that explains what is in that record and more importantly, what is not in that record and why it is not in that record. And I would encourage you to be creative. Um, we're, we're as I said, we're struggling with a, actually a former guy out of my office, uh, uh, Todd Candy, has now gone off to private practice in McKenna, Long and Aldridge on the West Coast. And frankly, he thinks he's the smartest guy in suspension and debarment. And if you look at Law 360, you might agree with that. He's always writing stuff. But um, Todd, Todd is being very aggressive. And I frankly, you know, he's got his reasons for doing it. But this is the first time I've ever been uh, in a situation where I realized that we are being set up for a procedural challenge. All right? And it makes for a very difficult way to deal with this record. And essentially, what we are going to do to sort of kind of close this out is Next week, after I get done with this and some travel this week, we're going to spend an entire day, if necessary, and we're going to work with that record. We're going to get the whiteboard. We're going to have everybody in the, into a conference room. And we're going to make sure that we have done this properly. Um, there's just so much that can go wrong when you have multi-parties. I just encourage you that when you have these problems, reach out to other folks that may have dealt with this before and try to figure out how they've done it. Be creative, but ultimately, you've got to be reasonable, you've got to be fair. And the only way you're going to be able to convince anybody you've been reasonable and fair is to ensure that you have a contemporaneous record. All right? It can be very, very difficult. Questions? All right, thanks.